Habakkuk chapter number 3. We'll read one verse, and this is a verse you would typically read before revival meeting. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse number 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known in wrath. Remember mercy. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we enjoyed the singing. Lord, uh, we enjoyed the testimonies. Lord, we just enjoy being in church. We enjoy hearing your name lifted up and heralded your name is wonderful and our heart ought to pant after you as the deer panteth after the water brook and Lord uh, we ought to desire those garden time experiences and Lord there was something about when we met the master how it changed our lives and Father we bless you for the good singing every song exalted you we're thankful Lord that we can come into this place and worship you in spirit and in truth. We're thankful for how much you've walked through here in the last week. We're thankful how our hearts have been stirred and our souls have been blessed and our eyes have been opened. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Now, Father, I pray as Brother Tony prayed, you'd bless those working with the children on the other side. Lord, I'm thankful for them young children. I'm thankful, Lord, for parents and grandparents that have them in church. Lord, I'm thankful they're being taught about Jesus. And I pray that, Lord, uh, uh, any that haven't been saved, that, Lord, you'd save them. And any that haven't reached the age of accountability, when they do, you'd save them then. Father, I pray for those working with their teens. Lord, you'd bless their efforts. These teens face a lot in school and in life. And, God, I pray you'd help them and undergird them and God, you'd bless their efforts the same, and I too pray if any of them hadn't been saved, they'd get saved. Lord, I pray if there's anybody sitting in the sanctuary tonight that's never been saved, I pray they'd get saved. And I pray for your people. Lord, there's been so much dumped on them this week, and Lord, I know they're just so full. And I pray that tonight you would just do something special for them, something that will cause them and propel them this week to shine as lights in this dark, filthy, wicked world that we live in. Lord, as we go back to our jobs and school and all those things that we'll face this week, may everyone that we come in contact with take note that we've been with Jesus. Bless now. Speak to hearts. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy, wonderful, and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to notice this verse, break it down in three sections and then give you the thought I have tonight. I want you to notice Habakkuk's reception of God's message. Look what it says again. It says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. Habakkuk had heard the message of the Lord. Now I know you're in church, most of you, about every night this past week. Did you hear the message? Hmm? Uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about personalities. Heard a lot of people talk about the preachers and their vernacular and their methods. Uh, but I wonder, did you really hear the message? Amen. Can I say, if you read chapter number 2, you'd find that God uh, spoke to Habakkuk, the prophet, and told him... Uh, that Israel uh, uh, had become very wicked and very sinful. Uh, she'd built her houses and built her land uh, upon the blood of innocent people. Uh, 
She was guilty of violence and spoil. Uh, she was guilty uh, of wickedness and drunkenness. Uh, she was guilty uh, of worshiping gods of stone and gods of uh, uh, metals and gods of wood. Uh, and God uh, had been fed up with her. And God sends a message, a stern message, uh, that judgment was coming. Uh, and here Habakkuk says, Lord, I've heard... Uh, your speech. Uh, he received the message. Friend, we don't even have to even talk about America. If you see all the things that Israel was guilty of, America's doing it in reveille Amen. and glorifying in it. Right. Habakkuk received God's message. Uh, I fear, Brother Ron, there were folks that sat here last week. They heard the good singing. They heard the songs that exalted the Lord. They heard the preaching. But they didn't hear the message. They sat here, but they're no different tonight than they were this time last Sunday night. He received God's message. Notice Habakkuk's reaction. He says, O Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. Look at verse 16 of chapter 3. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. When he heard God's message... And he saw that it was being carried out. He was afraid. All the preaching and all that we heard this week, I wonder, has it caused your heart to tremble? The Lord's coming. That ought to upset some of us. Number one, he's coming and you're going to have to give an account. I'm going to have to give an account. That ought to trouble us. Number two, we know people that aren't ready to meet him. That ought to trouble us. There are some people that he's going to throw off into the lake of fire. That ought to trouble us. Mm. Did it trouble you enough to do something about it? Some of you have already eased right back to where you was before the meeting. He was so troubled, he, he couldn't be the same. Hmm? When true revival hits, you won't be the same. Amen. Hmm? And notice Habakkuk's request. Look what he says, verse number 3. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known, and wrath, remember mercy. His request wasn't for judgment. His request was for mercy. His request was, God, I know they don't deserve it, God, I know they're wicked. God, I know they've come way short of your glory. But God, would you once again be long-suffering? Would you send revival? God, in your wrath, will you remember mercy? Amen. He pleaded for mercy. I ought to preach on this thought tonight, now that you've gotten good and sober. I want to preach on how to know you've been revived how to know you've been revived some of you act like you're walking on water I hope you are I doubt it the reason revival is not sustained is because we don't get revived the reason revival is not sustained is because we put too much emphasis on the wrong things hmm we put emphasis on the preacher. We put emphasis on his personality. We put emphasis on how much we enjoyed being in service. None of those things are revival. Right. Amen. So how do you know 
if you've been revived. Well, can I say there'll be some changes? Sure. To revive means to make alive again. Yeah. It means to remove some things. So you know you've been revived if there's been a renewal of enthusiasm for the work of God. The psalmist said in Psalms 85, 6, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? There'll be some enthusiasm for the things of God. Uh, uh, used to you is going through the motions coming to church. Uh, now there's an enthusiasm. Uh, 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 boy, it was good being in church. We can't wait to get back. Uh, you get excited a little bit about the things of God. Uh, uh, some things begin to change in your home and in your life. Uh, and all of a sudden, what used to be a drudgery uh, now is a delight. Uh, uh, there's a renewal of the enthusiasm for the work of God. Uh, it'll be seen in your service. Uh, uh, it'll be seen in your service towards God. Uh, uh, you'll see a difference in your worship. Uh, 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 you just won't drag in and drag out. Uh, but you come in uh, and you're looking forward to church uh, and you can't wait for singing and preaching. Uh, you like going around and fellowshipping before church. Uh, hey, uh, we know the preaching and the singing's on you soaking it up like a sponge. Uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, uh, you're eating with both hands. Uh, you can't get enough in. Uh, uh, you love it. Uh, it'll be seen in your worship. Uh, hey, it'll be seen in your works. Uh, hey, you just look different when you're serving God. Uh, uh, no longer is it I have to do this. Uh, it's I get to do this. Uh, and you'll want to do something for God. Uh, and you'll follow through and do it. Uh, you'll see an enthusiasm uh, in your willingness. Uh, preacher, uh, I'm willing to do anything. Uh, anything for I'm cleaning toilets to sweep in the parking lot uh, uh, just uh, because Jesus has been so good uh, and you've got an excitement to do anything for him. Uh, you'll see the enthusiasm in your service. You'll see an enthusiasm in your smile. Your countenance will be different. So I know some of you didn't get revived. I'm looking at the same long, sad, droopy face that I looked at last week. You remember Droopy, don't you? Huh? Jaws hanging down. I'm so happy. Mm. Uh, you don't have a different countenance. You see, people that have been with Jesus, even their countenance changes. And some of you, you're looking like you did last week. Your countenance, there would be a smile. Huh? You know, I read somewhere, I don't know, I don't know anything about the human body, but I read somewhere that it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Yeah. Well, if you don't like exercise as much as I don't like exercise, you want to use less muscles, so try smiling a little bit. Uh, but if you've been with Jesus, you can't help but smile. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? You can't help it. Right. Now, can I help you with something? The devil tried real hard to knock the enthusiasm out of this place this week. Sure. He sent some visitors in, and there were visitors that came to get something, and then there were visitors to come in and just sit back and yeah. see if there was really anything to us. And there were some visitors sent in to actually, if nothing else, get on my nerves. Now, don't be trying to think in your mind who they are, because you'll be wrong. But I'm telling you, there were some people that showed up here that wasn't interested in Jesus. Hmm? All for the purpose of sucking the joy out of God's people. And can I say, the devil's going to do that this week. Mm -mm. He's going to do everything he can to steal or kill or destroy what you got last week. Amen. Mm -mm. But if you got real revival, right. he can't suck the joy out of your smile, yeah. your countenance. People will know. They'll know. They'll say, you've been in church a lot, haven't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them, they'll know because you quit cussing. Oh, my. Yeah. 
That was just a joke. Don't take that serious, Brother Aaron. Huh? Mm. But I will say this. There will be a change in enthusiasm in your speech. Sure. Now, I purposely stayed in my office before both services today. I did it purposely. And tonight, I got a, I got a message. I highlighted it and everything. It's in my Bible. I was back there. I, got to, I thought, man, that's good. The Lord wouldn't let me preach it because you need to hear this tonight. I purposely stayed back there because I didn't want to hear what was said in the vestibule. I didn't want to hear what was said before people, you know, before the service, because what you was talking about determines your enthusiasm. I wonder how many people were talking about the goodness of God. Yeah. wonder how many people were talking about, boy, man, God helped me in revival. Boy, isn't Jesus good? Isn't things wonderful? I wonder how much speech there was about that, and then I wonder how much speech was done about earthly things. Amen. You see... Even though Brother Cody Zorn delivered the mail, too many people are still living underneath the sun. And it's noticed in their speech. Because hmm? if it's in your heart, it comes out your mouth. Hmm? Huh? And I, there's a difference in your speech. I wonder. Now, I had, I had a few people stop me. And all they want to talk about was the goodness of God. And I thank the Lord for that. But can I let you in on a little secret? Some of you have been here a while know this. There's a reason I don't hang out with a lot of people for church. I don't want to hear about your corns. I don't want to hear about your problems. I don't want to hear about everything that's went wrong. Because that bogs down my spirit before I get up to preach. Hmm? I don't need a bunch of junk in my head. As a matter of fact, I've got a rule, and most of you know it. You don't come and talk to me about any kind of matter that matters before I get up to preach. After service, you can talk to me all you want to talk to me. I'll give you time and all that. For church, I don't need my head full of a bunch of junk before I get up. I'm trying to get the mind of the Lord. But I can say this about revival. There'll be an enthusiasm in your speech for Jesus. I want you to do some inventory right now. What was you talking about for church? Boy, it's real quiet for a church that has come out of revival meeting. Amen. I'm just telling you how to know if you got revived. Because mm -hmm. when Jesus moves in in revival and he wakes you up and he renews you, it'll change your speech, it'll change your smile, your countenance, it'll change your service, it'll change your spirit. You'll be in a better mood. Sure. Can I say that there are some of you this time last week, you had an awful spirit. But you don't this week. Amen. I know some of you got some help this week because you got a different spirit. Yeah. You got a different mood about you. Yeah. Listen, I know we're moody people. Mm? Amen. And if you hang out with the devil long enough, you're going to get a foul spirit. But if you get revived, you'll get a sweet spirit. Right. You'll have a different mood. Mm? Uh, but if you didn't get revived... You're still old sourpuss. Mm -mm. Uh, you're still sucking your thumb. You still got a woe is me attitude. Uh, boy, it's getting quiet again. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about if, if, if you truly got revived, there'll be a renewal for the enthusiasm for the work of God. You can't wait to get to church. You don't care who sings or who preaches. You want in on it. Uh, and friends, when you've been with Jesus, there's a change. Yeah. Amen. That's what revival's all about. Putting things back the way they should have been. Because right. we let ourselves get in the way. We let the world get in the way. Uh, and we got all out of kilter. Can I say this? There, it'll be seen in your step. Yeah. Hmm? There are Eeyore Christians... I already know who they are. I avoid them like a plague. When you do shake hands with them, good to see you. Thanks for noticing. And I, and I get it. Because if I had a tail nailed to my hind end, I wouldn't be in a good mood either. But that's their problem. They got all their worries nailed to them. Sure. Hmm? There's... Speedy Gonzalez Christian. 
Woohoo! Rebay, rebay! Can't wait to get to church. Rebay, rebay! Google him. He was a great Looney Tune. Uh, uh, I can't do him. Those days are gone. But what I'm saying is somebody's got a spring in their step about the Lord because they have an enthusiasm for the things of God. Hmm? Now listen, some of us don't kick as high as we used to, but we still got an enthusiasm. You can see it in our step. Hmm? And then there's some. No revival. You know you've been revived when there's a renewed enthusiasm for the work of God. Can I say you know you've been revived when there's a renewed expression of your worth to God? See, get to the place, if we're not careful, the devil will convince us that we deserve something from God. The devil will convince us that we're better than other people. The devil will convince us that we have arrived. But what revival does is it puts things back in perspective. Hmm? Again, Isaiah said this in Isaiah 57. By the way, you only find the word revived, I think it's only about 13, 14 times in the Bible. And most of the time it's about dead people being raised again. Or the death of a nation being raised again. It's only about three times it really refers to what we refer to it as, as God's people being revived towards him. But in Isaiah 57, he said this in verse number 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, the Lord, uh, whose name is holy, uh, I dwell in a high and holy place uh, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit uh, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. When true revival breaks out in your heart, you realize your work to God, you realize you're not worth anything. And that's when he revives you. When you're humbled before him and when you show contrition before him, that's the one he revives. Those that get broken, he specializes in mending broken things. Uh, he's uh, the potter with the clay. Uh, but as long as you're sitting on a shelf uh, thinking you're prettier than everybody else, uh, he'll never put a hand you, uh, but when you become broken before the potter, uh, he takes a little oil uh, and takes his hands and puts them on you uh, and begins to do a work, uh, and he really makes your vessel worth looking at. Huh? Can I say, if you truly got revived, there'll be some repentance. Yeah. There's some people, there was no contrition at all, all last week. I don't know how you can sin under that preaching last week and not show any contrition towards God. Hmm? Uh, there was some wonderful preaching. Hmm? Um, first the Lord broke us down, then he filled us up. If you're listening, if you got revived. If not, you're just a broken vessel that could hold no water. But can I say, if you truly got revived, there'll be repentance. There'll also be a remorse for wasted time. Hmm? I don't know about you, but I got more years behind me than I got in front of me. Hmm? Huh? And I look back over them 49 years for God, and I'd like to say every one of them has been wonderfully used for God, but I'd be lying tonight. And revival has a way of showing you that you're not doing all you can be, and you haven't been doing all you can for the Lord. And there'll be a remorse for wasted time. There'll be repentance, a broken heart towards God. There'll be remorse. Uh, and then there'll be retribution. You'll have a desire to make it up to God. Sure. You know you can't ever earn His favor. But because he's been so good to you, because he's been long-suffering, uh, because he did remember uh, mercy when it came to his wrath, uh, uh, because he's shown you kindness and forgiveness, uh, you want to make it up to him. You want to live for him. You want to please him. Uh, you want God uh, to look at you and realize what work he done in you was not in vain. There'll be retribution. Hmm? If you don't get revived... You're still one of them that thinks that God should be pleased with you anyway. Or you're still one of them who don't care if God's pleased with you. Hmm? 
Boy, that's that's a that's a a poor attitude to have towards God for all that He's done for us. And yet there's people who sit in a pew that really don't care if God's pleased with them or not. Can I say that every child that has been orphaned in an orphanage longs for their parents to come back and get them? And they long to please their parent who doesn't deserve their longing and love because the parents dumped them. And everybody around them can see that, but they can't see it because there's something built in them. And there's something built in you to please your parents. And when you get born again, there's an inherent thing in that adoption of sonship that ought to cause you and I to want to please him. And what revival does is it brings back the fact that we really haven't been, and it rekindles that fire to please the Lord. There'll be a renewal expression of your work to God. Lord, I know I'm not much, but I sure do want to please you. Can I say this? If you truly got revived, this is how I know you've been revived. There'll be a renewal of exertion to witness to those without God. What did Habakkuk do? He cried for revival and he cried for God to remember mercy in his wrath. He was saying, God, have mercy on those that do not know you, those that are wicked, those that do not serve you, those that serve other gods. God, revive your people. God, have mercy on them. My dear friend, if you truly got revived, you have a desire to see those that tonight are cussing God, those that are living wicked without God, those that are on their way to hell, you have a desire to see them saved. If you got revived. If you didn't get revived, you really don't care. Oh, you say you want to see folks saved, but you don't want to see them bad enough to do anything about it. Sure. Hmm? Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you prayed for lost people to get saved? When was the last time you gave somebody a gospel track? When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When was the last time you invited somebody to church? When was the last time you were a witness for God to a lost person? Sure. Revival will cause you you want to be a witness. Hmm. Boy, it's getting awful quiet in here tonight. Amen. I only got one more point, but I think I'm going to drag it out and just make you really miserable. Huh? Huh? Just because we have a meeting don't mean you got revived. Amen. Revival is a change of heart and attitude towards God. It's a rekindling of the fire that's in your heart. See, when we're without revival, the devil does everything he can to put a damper on that fire that's in your soul. And everybody that saves got a fire. It may be just a little amber, but you got a fire. And revival starts breathing on it and causes it to get more intense and hopefully break out into a blaze. This might be interesting since I'm prolonging this message. Brother McNeese brought something interesting to us at lunch the other day. Now, if you are familiar with the Baptist faith and you're familiar with the Bible Belt, how come the air conditioner's on, Ray? We got the heat on on that side and the air conditioner on on this side. I'm feeling a little hot right now, so I'm going to hang out over here. Y'all just got to listen over there. Uh, but can I say in the Bible Belt, which is down in the south, which claims that they've got a corner on the market when it comes to God and revival and the things of God, because for, for years there have been great campaigns and great meetings and a lot of people saved in the south. Up north, they tend to be a little more liberal, and they don't tend to embrace the doctrines in the Bible and preaching. They, they don't like spit, slobber, and holler, shooting, sh shooting, and throwing babies, and running laps, and all that. They think all that's unnecessary. But you get down to some of them camp meetings down in, that's happening yesteryear in the South, I mean, it gets crazy. 
There was a great Baptist preacher by the name of Percy Ray. Percy Ray was the last great man of God that I know of that walked the face of the earth. And Percy Ray, I mean, God used him to pray in things and do miraculous things. And he used to have a camp meet in Myrtle, Mississippi, and there'd be two, 3,000 people there every time there was a service. They built a big tabernacle, and people still talk about those meetings. Uh, there was great meetings down throughout the South. And uh, what Brother McNeese brought to our attention, the first camp meeting that was ever on the face of the earth can be attributed to a small little holler right outside of Paris, Kentucky. It was actually in the 1800s and it was in a little Methodist church. Now don't let that blow your theology. See, you got to understand back in the early 1800s and really till the early 1900s any Christian denomination that preached the Bible, they only, they only had the King James Bible. And can I say people got saved in Methodist churches, people got saved in other denominations that was preaching the gospel, preaching the Bible. Huh? Can I say at one time the Methodist church and the Baptist church was very, very close, very similar. But in 1901, Wilcott and Hort's uh, 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 text came out, and they started revising the Bible. And by the way, the first year we got a revised Bible in America is also the first year somebody ever spoke in tongues in America. You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. And can I say that uh, then denominationalism started where denominations wanted a corporate head. Uh, uh, can I say well, in 1969, the Methodists uh, united. They started... Uh, 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 changing some things from then. They don't even resemble what they used to be. Uh, 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 the Wesley brothers that started the Methodist faith would roll over in their grave tonight uh, over what's being preached because the Methodists have a line back with the Church of Rome, Catholic Church. Hmm? Can I say that? Let me give you a little Bible, a little denominational history. The world will tell you you're either Catholic or Protestant. And Protestants were protesting the Catholic faith and they came out of the Catholic faith. That's where you got your Methodists, your Presbyterians, your Lutherans, your Episcopalians, all them, and they've all lined back up with the Catholic faith today. They're all teaching very similar doctrine as the Catholics in saying they're not Catholics. Can I say uh, Baptists are not Protestants? You can trace what we preach and what we believe all the way back to Jesus. It's a wonderful book called The Trail of the Blood. I highly recommend it. You read that book and you'll find out the Baptist faith has been here since uh, Jesus was here. It's the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Can I say this? We haven't always been called Baptists. Early on, they called us by whatever town that the church was started at or they called us by the name of the preacher. You'll find it in your Bible. There was the church of Ephesus. There was the church of Philippi. There's the church of Thessalonica, the church of Galatia. There was a church in Rome. They weren't called Baptist church. They were called the church. Uh, later on, as uh, the apostles started taking the gospel called across the world, they were called Paulicians because they preached what Paul preached uh, and Waldensians and all kinds of things. But the faith was always the same faith we have tonight. Even if you go to a Southern Baptist seminary, they will tell you the Baptist faith started in 1534. Because that's when the Southern Baptist denomination started. Can I say they were calling us Anabaptists a thousand years before that? Because we were anti infant baptism. Read that book, Trail of the Blood. It'll help you on a lot of that stuff. But back in the early 1800s, the first camp meeting started at a little Methodist uh, 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 campground just outside Paris, Kentucky. And it went on uh, 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 for how many weeks? Six weeks or something. People came from far and wide. I'm talking about horse and buggy. Uh, and God moved and God breathed. And he ended up building a church on that site. I said, I'd say this. That intrigued Brother McNeese, the first camp meet was in Kentucky. And he came to Kentucky, mentioned it to Christian. Christian looked it up, showed him right where it was. The old church building still standing. 
And he's trying to get permission to take a group of men down there and just pray on that site. I said, it sounds to me like you're wanting to stir some ambers. He said, that's exactly what I'm talking about, preacher. Huh? Wouldn't that be a blessing to go to that place and God break out something like that? That's nowhere in the message. I was just delaying it to make some of you real miserable. <laughs> you know, you don't have revival in your heart if you haven't had a renewal of those things. But also, if you've been revived, there'll be a renewal of exaltation to the worthiness of God. Amen. You can't wait to brag on Jesus. Yeah. I don't know, did you listen to the four songs that were sung tonight? They were all about Him. Yes. They weren't about trials of life. They weren't about problems in life. They were about Him. Huh? And if your spirit has truly been revived, you can't help but point to Him. Sure, Because you're living above the sun. Hmm? You're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You know, you've been revived. If there's a renewal for the enthusiasm for the work of God, if there's a renewal for the expression of your worth to God. Amen. There's a renewal of exertion to witness to those without God. And if there's a renewal for exaltation to the worthiness of God. Let me ask you a question tonight. Have you been revived? So preacher, we just had a revival meeting. That's not what I ask you. Have you personally been revived? Are you different tonight than you were this time last Sunday night? I didn't ask you if you have arrived. I've asked you if you've been revived. Because hmm? we always still need some work on us. But has there been a renewal in your life for the things of God? It'll show out on you if there has if not you can be revived tonight all you got to do is cry Abba yeah. Father yeah. and you'll find he's right there he says you have not because you ask not you're willing to ask God to revive you tonight you're willing to ask God to do something for you tonight he will but it all starts with the same thing it would have started with last week. You have to admit that you're not as far along as you think you are. And you need Him. Will you be revived? Say, so, preacher, I am revived. Hallelujah. Will you stay revived? That's a whole other message. But it all centers around those same things. When you're so busy about the Father's business, you don't have time for the devil's business, and you'll stay revived. God help us to be a church that's revived. Let's all stand. Miss Tina, if you'll come to the piano, just play something. If she comes, God spoke to your heart, the altar's open. Sometimes we can't have revival, Brother Brian, because we got an alt with a brother. Maybe, maybe tonight, that's your problem. You didn't get revived last week because you got a, an alt with a brother. Maybe you didn't get revived because you got pride in the way or bitterness in the way. I want to tell you something. God's willing to revive. Wilt thou be revived? She's playing. Some are praying. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the burden of Habakkuk for his people. God, burden us for souls. Burden us, Lord, to live close to you. Burden us to be used of you. Certainly burden us to exalt you. God, speak to hearts now. 
Lord, I don't know why I said that about an ought, about bitterness, but Lord, you brought that out. There might be somebody here tonight with an ought. Lord, I pray they'd get that thing settled. Might be somebody full of pride. I pray they'd repent of that. Might be somebody that's got a bitter spirit. They got bitterness in their life. And Lord, they'll never extract that themselves. They'll need to depend on you to extract that bitterness and replace it with the love of God. God, I pray somebody come get that thing taken care of. Whatever the need, Father, speak to hearts. Bless these that are in the altar or in their seats praying. God, continue to send revival in our camp. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.